Yep, it's another gun show video. It seems like you guys never really get tired of watching them, and I never really get tired of making them. This one's actually spanning two gun shows because I went to a gun show last month and I got some things, but I didn't really get that much, so it didn't really necessitate a video. Then there was a second gun show today, so I got a couple extra things, and so this is both gun show videos put together. As usual, we're gonna start with some of the less interesting things and go forward to some of the more interesting things. I've been looking for 9mm Makarov for a while now. Um, I have a Makarov and I really like it, but it is kind of hard to find ammo for. However, a guy at the gun show had three boxes of this Norinco 9mm Makarov um, that I was really excited to get my hands on. I've seen it on Gunbroker and things like that. He was only charging $15 a box, which is about as good as you can get for 9mm Makarov in this market. So I think this stuff is supposed to be non-corrosive, but I'm going to treat it like it's corrosive just because I'm really not 100% sure. Um, so yeah, nine by 18. And then he had three of those, and he also had two of uh, three of these little baggies. I only actually ended up coming away with two of them. One of them has that same Norinco ammo, and then the other one has an ammo that actually I haven't identified yet. Um, but it is all factory ammo, it's not reloads or anything like that. Speaking of weird ammo with somewhat mysterious origins, um, one guy had four bags of ammo like this. It is eight millimeter Mauser, 50 each, and he was charging $15 per bag. And so uh, I offered him 50 for all four, and he said yes. So I got 200 rounds of eight millimeter Mauser for $50, which is a really good deal. Um, most of it's not very good stuff. This Argentinian ammo I've tested, but I haven't uploaded the video on yet. That should be coming in a few months. And then it also has Yugoslavian ammo mixed in as well that I think should be pretty quality. Um, regardless, I'll find some sort of use for it. And it was really cheap, so it's just kind of cool to have. Even if there is just an extra year or something like that, that's an extra video for me to make. Oh, I guess he also gave me this Turkish bandolier with those. He didn't charge me. I just said, hey, is that a Turkish bandolier? And he said, yeah, you want it? And he threw it in the bag. So that was really kind of him. The last ammo I have to show you today is actually really interesting. I bought like eight or nine rounds of this Remington 1917 762x54R. I'll try and take some pictures of the head stamp to put in the video, um, but this ammo I grabbed for the sole reason that it is incredibly interesting. I don't really plan on shooting it. I believe there were a couple 7.62x54 rifles floating around at this time, or they were made to be sent to Russia because that was in the middle of World War I. So it just says Remington and 17. I believe the 17 is a date. I might try and put those up on Gunbroker, but I'm definitely going to save a couple because they're really cool. Next, let's talk about some guns. Uh, the first thing I got was this 22. It is a Harrington and Richardson uh, Model 922. And it's just a double action, single action, 22 long rifle revolver. Um, the way that you operate it, of course, you could just pull the trigger if you have rounds in it. I don't. Um, but there is a little notch right here. So if you pull that, then you can pull out this piece right here and remove the cylinder. This is really the only way to load and unload it. Um, there is a loading gate, but it's really hard to use. It's, it's meant to be loaded like this. This also acts as your ejector, so you push out each round individually using this piece right here. Holds nine shots. Um, normally, I don't take things to the range before I do these videos, but this is one of the things that I bought a couple weeks ago. I actually quite like this pistol. I've just been looking for something to practice pistol shooting with a little bit because I just don't really have the skill set. And although this has a decent trigger pull, as in it's decently smooth and it's not overly heavy, um, if you're shooting at double action, there is a serious amount of trigger pull, so it can help you get over some of those things like pulling it low into the left, which is one of the problems I'm having right now. So it's a lot cheaper than 9mm, and I can get some good practice in. I got another really cool gun. Uh, I've had some 7.62x54R ammo stored up for a while, and I've been wanting to do a review series similar to my 8mm Mauser series. The one thing that's been holding me up is that I have an M44 and I have an 1891, but by far the most common and probably most useful um, rifle in the US civilian market that shoots that caliber is the 9130. And so I found this 9130 um, and I just saw the date, saw it was I think 300 bucks and decided to pick it up. Um, I did not notice there was a chip in the stock on the left side, um, but other than that it is actually in semi-decent shape. The wood is pretty scratched up, which I mean is reasonable for a rifle of this age. 
Um, and being a 1943 rifle, this one has some kind of interesting markings. If you've ever handled a Mosin that was made during World War II, you know that the markings and really a lot of the manufacturing is fairly crude. So the serial number is on the barrel shank, and then there is like electric penciled serial numbers on the bolt, the base of the magazine, uh, the back of the butt plate, and I think that's it. Um, so you can check those components and see if the numbers match. This one is all matching, um, which is cool, even though it is in kind of rough shape. I actually kind of like the rough shape because one, that means I really don't need to baby it. When I get a gun that's either rare or is in immaculate condition, I kind of have a hard time, you know, using it like I would use a common rifle I went to the gun store and bought. Um, this one, I don't necessarily have that worry because it's not, it's, it's in good shape, but it's not perfect. I also really like the rough manufacturing because it just tells the story of this rifle. Obviously, I don't know the exact story of where this rifle was, but it could have been used in combat. I got one more rifle today that I am really, really excited about. It is an Ishapur 2A1. You might be asking, John, you already have an Ishapur 2A1, and you are correct. It's currently sitting in a box right down there. However, the issue with that one is that I accidentally bulged the barrel. I'll talk about that in a video at some point. Um, but that's been a big issue with that rifle. I can't really maintain accuracy, and if I want to do velocity testing with 7.62 rounds, with that bulged barrel, there's a ring towards the end. Uh, I don't really feel like I would get very consistent results, and it could mess with it, so I just don't feel comfortable doing that type of video for you guys. This rifle gives me that capability. Now, my original intent buying this, uh, I was looking for a sporterized one, but I found this one instead where the wood is in kind of rough shape. My original intent was to buy a sporterized one, take the barrel and receiver and put it on in my rifle's wood, and then take my rifle, put it in the barreled receiver, cut down the barrel behind that bulge because it would still be at least 16 inches long, and then have sort of like an Ishapur 2A1 carbine and an Ishapur 2A1 universal short rifle. When I found this one, my next thought was, okay, so what I could do is I could switch the barreled actions, um, and then my rifle put in this stock, and since this stock is in such rough shape, especially the forend has some, some cutaways and some tears, and some is broken a little bit, I wouldn't necessarily feel as bad cutting it shorter and turning it to one of those tanker type carvings. Um, it would be a lot of work, but it could be a really cool project. However, the more I look at this rifle, the more I see some interesting things about it. Most of the Ishapur 2A1s have this horrible black paint on all of the metal. So here is the nose cap of my other Ishapur 2A1, and if I hold it up you can see that there's just some places where the black paint has chipped away, and it looks nicer underneath. Now let me grab this one and show you the metal. It looks like it is like parkerized or blued, it doesn't have that black paint on it, which is really good uh, for this rifle, it means that it's in good condition. The second thing is, when I look at the stock, let me, let me hold it up here, you will see that there is a piece of wood covering right here, and also the stock markings just look really old. I think that this is a pretty old stock, and I don't know if I would feel right cutting it up like I was originally planning the more I'm looking at it. Now, I do still have some more looking into to do, some more research to do. Another thing that gives this away is the um, brass butt plate. At the time that India was making the Ishapur 2A1, they were using uh, like a steel colored butt plate, or I don't know, it's kind of like a tin color, I don't know exactly what metal it's made out of. However, this one still has the brass. So it's possible that the wood for this rifle is actually quite old, maybe even World War I old, which would be really cool and then I wouldn't necessarily feel as good about cutting it up. Obviously, I haven't made a full decision on that yet. However, I am interested in hearing your guys' comments, so please let me know down below. Do you think that it would be a cardinal sin to cut this stock up? Because if you look right here, um, right there, there's supposed to be wood and it is torn away. Uh, do you think it would be a cardinal sin to cut this up, or do you think it would be okay since it's already damaged and not really in good shape? Now, while I'm waiting on your guys' feedback about that, let's get into the second part of this video, and that is gun show etiquette. Every time I do a gun show video, I like to show you the things I purchased, and I like to give you some practical tips and tricks. This time I'd like to talk about proper etiquette and rules that you should follow. Now if you're familiar with the gun show scene, this part's probably not going to be very new to you, but it's still good as a refresher. And the first thing that I would like to talk about is that even though you are at a gun show and every gun should be unloaded, you should still use proper safety rules. 
So when you pick up a gun from the table, you don't want to point it at the clerk. You, if there's a crowd of people that way, you don't want to point it at them. You want to do as much as is in your power to make sure that you are not pointing a gun directly at anyone. Now, if it's a crowded gun show, sometimes that's hard or nearly impossible, but it is something you should still try to do. And if it is impossible, you should check to make sure the gun is unloaded first, of course, and then don't point it at somebody who is directly in front of you. Um, do what you can though. And part of what I mean is like, let's say you want to check out the sites and there's a table in front of you, so you can't do that. You might want to do it up here. You don't want to do it out this way because then you could be looking directly at a person. Instead, do it up. But while you are bringing it from here to up, there might be some people in that path. Um, it's kind of unavoidable at certain crowded gun shows, but do the best you can. Also, follow the finger off the trigger rule. We're going to talk about triggers again in just a second. But just do what you can to appear as safe as possible to make everybody else feel comfortable. The second thing we're going to talk about is also important for safety. And that is that if you are at a location that allows you to carry, and if you are carrying, do not pull your weapon out unless you actually need it. And if you do actually need it, judicious marksmanship is appreciated. Um, but if you don't need it, let's say you are at the gun show um, and you see a Glock 19 on the table and you say, oh, I have a Glock 19. Look, that is going to be incredibly frightening to anybody around you who sees it. If you do want to do something, say you are looking for magazines for a particularly strange firearm, and so you want to take that gun in to try it out, or you want to try out holsters, usually there will be somebody out front that can zip tie the barrel or the receiver, and then you can put that somewhere that is not um, hidden on your hip. Um, that is the type of thing that, it, you know, if it's in a bag and you're reaching for it and it's clear it has the, the flag in it to let people know it's unloaded, that is preferred. There should be something in or on that gun to let people know that it is in fact unloaded. However, if you are concealed carrying for the purpose of concealed carrying, keep that firearm concealed, do not take it out. Now let's talk about triggers. Generally speaking, you should not dry fire the firearm at a gun show. And this is for a few reasons. With certain firearms, dry firing it can damage the firearm. This one is a uh, 22, so it's rim fire. Oftentimes rim fires, the firing pin can get damaged by dry firing the firearm. So because you might not be familiar with a specific firearm, you should not dry fire it. The second part of that is some people are under the impression, whether they are correct or incorrect is not up to me right now, but some people are under the impression that dry firing any firearm can harm it. And so if you are dealing with somebody else's property, um, what somebody else is trying to sell, you don't want them to think you are going to damage whatever they have. I'm gonna use a Mosin Nagant because I personally do not believe that dry firing a Mosin Nagant will hurt it, um, but I don't want to pick up the Mosin Nagant and then immediately pull the trigger. One, that's not really safe, and two, that could frighten whoever I'm talking to. Now there is one exception, and that is if you ask first or if the person gives you permission. Um, so for example, when I'm buying a Mosin Nagant, I've bought Mosin Nagants that have had bad triggers in the past, and so I just asked, hey, can I dry fire this? And as long as I was seriously considering purchasing it, I've not had anybody say no. Also, there are certain things you can do to dry fire a gun softly. So I will use this 22 revolver as an example. What I would do if I wanted to make sure that the trigger was operational, I would pull the hammer back, I would hold the hammer, pull the trigger and let it down slow. Um, and then if I wanted to try the double action, I'd do the exact same thing. Sometimes you may be looking at somebody's gun even if you don't intend on purchasing it, and the person will say something like, hey, you should test out the trigger on that thing. Um, if they say that, then of course you have their permission, so that's okay, but even then you should still check to make sure it's clear, just general firearm safety rules. So rule number three, don't dry fire unless you have permission. Fourth thing, at gun shows, almost always making offers and haggling is appropriate and is allowable, just don't be a jerk about it. With the 9mm Makarov ammo, um, the total of what I had came to $74, but I was buying quite a bit from the guy and I only had 70 cash on me, so I just said, hey, can, will you take 70? He said yes, it was nice and simple, we worked it out. When I bought the 54R ammo, he wanted $15 for this bag, which for normal 7.62x54R is insane. However, since these were especially historical rounds and I wanted them, I was still going to buy them. At that point, it would have been appropriate for me to say, yeah, I'm sorry, that's too much for me and walk away. But in this instance, I didn't really care. I wanted it, so I just paid for it anyway. People are usually willing to take some money off of items and especially if you are buying a lot from them. The fifth thing is you should bring cash. Now this is for two reasons. 
The first is very practical. A lot of people at gun shows are private sellers and they don't really have a way to take money that's not cash. And oftentimes they don't wanna have records of those kinds of things because some people at gun shows can be a little bit conspiratorial. However, this is also a common courtesy because one, it gives you the capability to buy from everyone there. And two, many private sellers or smaller retailers need to pay money if they take things in cards, in check or something like that, uh, Venmo or PayPal even. So because of that, cash is better for them as well. It's just kinder to the business owner. Sixth, remember that you are responsible for anyone you bring. One of the things I love about gun shows is seeing the wide range of people. I see people who bring their kids through. Um, this time I went, I brought a friend who, as far as I know before that, had actually never held a firearm before. And so it was really interesting getting to show him different things, getting to say, um, here, take this rifle, it's from your country. Um, hey, take a look at this. It's you know really modern. Take a look at this, it's really old, it's an antique. And so that was a really neat and unique aspect for him because he got to see a wide variety of things. However, I need to keep in mind that I am responsible for him. I need to be watching what he's doing just as much as I am paying attention to what I'm doing. If he's putting a gun back on a shelf and he drops it and it damages something, he damaged it because I brought him there and he doesn't know what he's doing. Also, before we went, I went through the same, some of the similar rules with him. Hey, just so you know, if you pick up a gun, do whatever you can not to point it at anybody um, and don't pull any triggers because one, that can scare people and two, it can damage certain firearms. We didn't go over the full firearm safety course because in this setting, we didn't really have to, but we just went over the few things that were important for this situation. So whether it is children, friends, girlfriends, or anybody else, remember that you are responsible for who you bring. Finally, here's your bonus thing that you can do, and that is don't be too political. Um, at one of the places that I went to, after I purchased something, the guy gave me this, don't blame me, I voted for Trump sticker. Um, and this is not a endorsement or a lack of an endorsement for Donald Trump. It's my personal opinion that although those things might be available at gun shows, there's really no reason to make everybody required to be a part of it. Um, you don't know who's going to be coming through, and personally, I'm of the perception that we need to welcome everyone into the community if we really want it to grow. The friend that I was with, I'm pretty sure is pretty far left, and so something like that could be offensive to him, where I'm trying to show him this hobby, show him this interesting thing, and show him that guns aren't scary, and then somebody is trying to uh, peddle side political topics on him, I just don't think that that's really fair. So I want to be clear, I don't see my channel as a forum for talking about politics, especially not politics that are so far removed from firearms. Um, so that's not what I'm talking about. I'm mainly just saying, I don't know if gun shows are really the forum for non-firearms related politics either. That though is something that I would be interested to hear your guys' take on in the comments. So please let me know about that. I am 8mm Mauser Man and I bought some really cool military surplus rifles, but I lived on. Which proves it's hard to get the best of a man named John. Name John.